Growing up, we all heard the story of the boy who cried wolf, a very famous fable that our parents tell us to teach us the importance of honesty. As you guys know, the boy who cried wolf for many, many repeated times would run into his village screaming wolf when there was no wolf. In the story, the little boy does this for attention until one day when there really is a wolf. And because the town folk, the village people, had gotten so used to this boy lying that at the moment he was telling the truth, no one believed him. Well, in my opinion, the same can be said about a lot of our unsolved history. Earlier this year, in January of 2024, News headlines broke out across the world. Allegedly, a man, a CEO of a company called Deep Sea Vision, had gone on an $11 million expedition to use sonar radar to scan the floor of the Pacific Ocean to try to find Amelia Earhart's missing plane. Allegedly, this man has since provided sonar pictures of what he believes to be the said plane of Amelia Earhart. Now, this is not the first time that people have claimed to have found her plane. But in my opinion, this seems to have grabbed the headlines a lot harder than other incidents. And the minute I saw this headline, the first thing I thought was, no, no, this is a distraction. And that plane in this picture looks like it's still pretty well put together, which I don't think would be the case if a plane had been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for 87 years. This got me really thinking about the whole Amelia Earhart saga, her life story, and what really happened. Well, as I was contemplating this big mystery, a TikTok popped up on my phone. A TikTok that I now can't find anywhere. A TikTok that claimed that everybody knew Amelia Earhart had faked her own disappearance and actually lived a happy life in North Carolina. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a huge, huge thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help support the channel, there is a link down in the description box below to become a patron or a producer of this channel. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about what I believe to be the Amelia Earhart lie. Now, as you can see, guys, I am not in my typical location. I am traveling right now, and I was not planning on filming this, filming anything while I was traveling. I was just going to research. But as I said, this TikTok popped up, and I started digging, and I thought, God, I just, I just got to talk to you guys. I got to film this because I am so curious to see what you have to say about this huge mystery, this huge conspiracy regarding probably one of the biggest modern day American folk heroes, legends of all time, Amelia Earhart. Now, again, as I said, you know, I am definitely somebody who loves legends. I love unsolved mysteries. I love conspiracies. I love to really consider wacky possibilities. Um, in our in our world around us but i'm also somebody that tries to stay grounded and tries to really rely on this idea of occam's razor occam's razor basically just means the most likely outcome is probably what happened and again in my opinion learning the amelia Earhart story i think i always just assumed like most people that she had run out of fuel and sadly landed in the pacific ocean Again, I think that's kind of the main theory with most people. And, and again, that, that that's obviously the theory that these deep sea investigators have relied on because why else would they be 
doing a sonar radar on the Pacific floor. But again, because this became such a big news story as of late with everything else going on in the world, my red flags went up, my alarm bells went up. And then as I said in the opening, oddly enough, as I was scanning through TikTok, a random TikTok popped up about Amelia Earhart having lived out a full life in North Carolina under an assumed identity. As I've said, I've, I've scoured the internet that now trying to find this TikTok and trying to find any type of references to back this person's claims, and they've all disappeared. So that's even more suspicious to me. So we're going to go through, on right now, we're going to go through a brief timeline of Amelia Earhart's life. I'm not going to go into so much, so much detail because we all know who she was. Um, and then talk about the possibilities of all these theories. I, doing research, I found all these conspiracy theories on what actually happened to this very enigmatic woman that lived less than 100 years ago. So let's get into it. Amelia Earhart was born on the 24th of July, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. Amelia was technically the second child. The parents, her parents had had a stillborn before Amelia, very, very sad, but she was their first living child. A few years later, she was joined by her sister, Grace, who they called Muriel. Now, Amelia herself would go by the two nicknames, one of Millie and one of A.E., now, the interesting thing about the Earhart family is that in this little town of Kansas, Amelia's family was kind of like aristocratic for a small town. Her mother's family was very, very prominent. Her father was a very popular judge in the town, and he was also the president of the Atchkinsons. Atchkinsons hard to say, bank. Now, the time period that Amelia was born really kind of is its own character, if you will, and is probably the reason why Amelia herself became so famous when she was alive. Again, this was the late 19th century, 1897, when she was born. Things were changing as far as women's rights all over the world. We're coming up in the early 20th century to the suffragette movement, where women all over the world would petition to be granted the simple right to vote. At this time, women were still not permitted in Ivy League colleges, but they were starting to open up women's colleges. So this need for females to get a higher education was definitely a part of the culture that Amelia had been born into. And her mother was a huge proponent of her daughters being just as educated as they could be at that time than any other boys. It is said that Amelia's mother pushed her daughters, Amelia and Muriel, to not be like sissy little girls, but to really know know how to take care of themselves, which was no problem, especially for Amelia, because it is stated that when Amelia was a little girl, she was quite rambunctious. She liked to climb trees, catch frogs, play outside with the boys. In fact, there's a story told by Amelia's niece that her and her mother one Christmas asked for an actual football, like an American football for my overseas viewers. And, and you know, American football still to this day is a male sport. So we can see this like hyperactivity in Amelia coming out at a very young age. This is a, this hyperactivity, this need to move and to groove and to be out in the world, this adventurous spirit that Amelia was honestly born with is, is what actually prompted her to do the daredevil things she did as an adult, the things that she became famous for. Now, both Muriel and Amelia, both the girls, got as much of an education as they could have at that time. Again, her their grandfather, their maternal grandfather was a judge. And the girls were kind of lived back and forth between their parents' house and their grandparents' house, which we'll get into why that was in a minute. And apparently in her grandparents' house, her grandfather had this wicked library. 
where the little girls, when, when, when they couldn't play outside, when it was too cold or too hot to play outside, they would come in and they would spend hours devouring the books in their grandfather's library, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I think children should love reading from a very early age. And again, this was the early 20th century when they were little, little tykes. So there was no entertainment as far as TV or anything like that. And so the only way for children to get entertainment outside of using their own imaginations is to read. Now, obviously, Amelia, as well as her sister Muriel, were very smart cookies. They come from smart cookies. I had somebody say that to me once when I was going through like a shamanistic course, like an intensive through yoga, where we had to talk about like our ancestors and our more recent ancestors, like our grandparents. And somebody said that to me once, oh, you come from a family of really smart people because one side of my family is judges and lawyers and the other side of my family is doctors and both of my grandmothers also went to university, which was very, very rare at the time. So this this is like definitely, in my opinion, using my own experience in my own life growing up, it seems that education and intelligence was really important to the Earhart family. And I can respect that, especially with two little girls in a time period where little girls pushing forward to receive the best education was not as common. Now, Amelia's father, Edwin, there was obviously some family drama between Amelia's maternal grandfather and her own father. Her father was also an attorney. Um, he worked for the railroads and the only problem, even though they say that Edwin was a very skilled attorney, a very smart attorney, he had an addiction. Edwin was, according to the research and according to the remaining family members, was an alcoholic. And so because of this, Edwin would often lose his jobs and he would have to kind of job hop around within the Midwest from state to state to state to get work until he was axed from that job as well. And so for a lot of Amelia and Muriel's formative years when they were really young, they spent a lot of time at their grandparents' house, which I don't blame them. That at least gives them some security so they're not hopping around to all these different towns with their father. Their parents ended up in California, though, uh, as, as Amelia was coming into her late teens, early 20s, which is where Amelia first kind of found airplanes. Now, when Amelia's mother, grandmother ended up passing away, this I found really peculiar. And I only found this in like one source. So I would be curious to see if anybody knows anything more about this. When uh, when her maternal grandmother passed away, years after her, her grandfather, there was obviously a trust fund established for Amelia's mother. These were her parents. Again, her parents were pretty affluent people. However, it, it is stated that Amelia's grandmother, her maternal grandmother, instead of like giving the money to... Amelia's mom, she ended up auctioning everything off because she was terrified that her son-in-law, Edwin, would spend all the money on booze. So you're going to punish your daughter by not giving her her inheritance because you're afraid her husband will spend the money on booze. So you're just going to make them be poor instead. That's very strange to me. And I'm, I'm still very confused by this. Now, again, this is a different time in the 1900s, right? I was born, as, as the young generation liked to tell us, I was born in the late 1900s. I was born in 1983. The early 1900s, totally different, different jive, right? You know, nowadays, for me as a woman, I when my parents hopefully a very long time from now do pass on, I will inherit in my own name. My partner will not have access to that, right? Because we know how to legally do that now so that it protects, trust funds are protected, you know, and, and women are aut autonomous beings. Like in this time period, women were not autonomous beings. So anything a woman inherited went really straight to her husband. So I guess it's, I guess it's not fair for me to judge this situation too harshly because it's not the time period that it's not my it's not my timeline right like it's not our timeline like we're in this timeline like that's not ours that was theirs and so maybe at that time um her grandmother was doing what she felt was right so the husband didn't ab abuse the money by 
using it for his addiction. I don't know. It, it just basically what I'm saying, what I'm getting to with this is when Amelia was a young girl, she grew up with wealth. They had servants, they had a very lavish lifestyle, you know, a library full of books. They were not in need of, of things. But then once her maternal grandparents passed away, financially, things were different for the Earhart's. And so this caused even more struggle and strife with Amelia's parents. And this is going to kind of play out in Amelia's adult life as a female pilot with this need for, for money. And it's going to kind of dictate things that Amelia does, which now researching this case, I actually understand now why Amelia became as famous as she did. And we're going to get into it. A lot of this came to money, guys. A lot of this came to Amelia being able to support herself in a time when women really couldn't, if that makes sense. So they moved to California. Eventually, Amelia's parents do end up getting divorced, which back then must have been very traumatic because that wasn't very common back then. Now, something I do want to note, Amelia and her sister Muriel were really close as two girls, and they both took very different paths. Muriel, her younger sister, who was also very active, very tomboyish, went off. She became a nurse um, for the soldiers during World War I. She ended up getting married after she finished her education and had children. She definitely followed more of the traditional path that women, women took back then, whereas Amelia never wanted that traditional path. Now, in 1917, so this was around the time where Amelia was, what, 20 years old? So her sister must have been like 17 or 18 years old. Her sister was working in like med tents. I don't know if they would be med tents, but she was working as a nurse in Canada for soldiers who were coming back wounded from World War I. A few months back, you guys, I had my friend Bobby come on my channel, who she'll be coming back eventually. She's just busy with work. But she did a deep dive into my grandmother's family, the Bennetts of South Georgia. I'm going to tag that video down below because as I was researching Amelia and Muriel, their stories were almost, in my opinion, identical to my grandmother's aunts, my great, great aunts, Louise and Millie. We talk about them in this episode. They were born in the same time period as Amelia, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and they were both suffragettes and they both um, were very independent. And I think they both were lesbians. I think Amelia was a lesbian too, which we're gonna get to that. But um, my great, great aunts also, went and worked in the med they actually went to france though to work in the, the med tents um the the bennett's benets they were french so they went over to, to france during world war one as like teenage girls to to work on and help nurse these soldiers of the allied forces back to health well amelia and muriel went to canada to do the same thing now again this wasn't nursing like we think of nursing today I mean, I am not educated in the medical field. I'm educated in the liberal arts, but I could probably, if, if, if it was the same time period, I could probably sign up to be a nurse and just go pat someone's head with water or use like, you know, teachers to try to help them, you know, really coax them and, and, and give them that support to get healthy again. So when I say that at 20 and like 18 and 20, that these girls were up in Canada working with the the um, soldiers coming back from World War One, it's not like it is now. That's kind of the point I'm getting to. But nonetheless, this is an important part of Amelia's story. And in a lot of the podcasts and documentaries I watched in preparing for this deep dive, not many people mentioned this. And I thought that was a shame that people didn't mention this, that they didn't think this time in Amelia's life was as important as I believe it was. Again, Amelia was a 20 year old girl in 1917. She had grown up in a very powerful family where she was encouraged to be independent. When she was a little girl, it is stated that she preferred to just wear her bloomers, which were like pants, instead of putting the dress on over it because she could run better and climb trees better. 
And then at 20, she goes off to Canada to help her sister work in these medical tents to help support Canadian and American soldiers who are wounded coming back from World War I. This is a lot. Amelia's already gone through a very adventurous life. She's highly educated. She's obviously very intelligent. She's got a lot of energy. She's very hyperactive. And she's in these hospitals all day with these soldiers coming back from the war who are around her age, right? And she's hearing stories about things that happened in World War I, including airplanes. Because the Wright brothers here in America, in North Carolina, which again, we're going to get to with the conspiracy of her ending up in North Carolina, the Wright brothers were the first in flight. In 1903, a little over a decade before, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the Wright brothers flew. So World War I was the first war in the official narrative of our history where there were these flying contraptions. So this little girl, Amelia, who had spent her childhood climbing trees, catching frogs, reading stories of grand adventures, at 20 years old, while nursing soldiers was hearing all these stories of these airplanes. And I'm sure these soldiers had a lot to say about the airplanes because this was new. Many of these soldiers would have probably never had the opportunity to get into an airplane at this time in history if it weren't for the war. Can you imagine that? I mean, we fly all the time now. Flying is not that big of a deal, but can you imagine what that must have been like at that time when all of a sudden people were in the air? Can you imagine trying to explain to somebody what that's like to be in the air looking at down on earth to somebody who's never even envisioned that being a possibility? This is why this time period, in my opinion, is important to Amelia's story. Again, she had an adventurous spirit, but that doesn't mean that adventurous spirit would have necessarily been channeled into aviation if it wasn't for her hearing all the stories of aviation from these soldiers. A few years later, in the early 1920s, it is stated that Amelia Earhart and a female friend, wink wink, went to the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, where they came face to face with these new flying contraptions called airplanes. And it is stated at this moment, Amelia was like, this is what I want to do. I want to fly. I really, I want to fly. I want to know what it feels like to be in the air. And so on the 3rd of January, 1921, Amelia had made her way back to California where she had her first ever flying lesson. At this point, Amelia cut her hair, that famous short kind of boyish haircut because she wanted to be taken seriously as an aviator. All the men had short hair, so she was going to cut her hair short too. Now, something interesting in one of the, the podcasts that I was listening to about aviation at this time in women, as I said earlier, this was also the time of the suffragettes. This is a time in history, lots of friction, where women are, are wanting to have a little bit more power and a little bit more authority in the working world. And in aviation, because aviation was so new, women were able to jump into it quickly, as one historian said, before the men knew how to stop them. So Amelia Earhart was not the first woman to ever be in aviation. In fact, her flying instructor was another woman. Now, the difference is, is as Amelia Earhart started to gain more independence before she was licensed, the idea of Amelia Earhart having a career in avi aviation was not feasible. 
male pilots were paid and male pilots could eventually go on to work for what would become commercial air flights, like going from warplanes to commercial planes, which I know even today, a lot of pilots today were men who served in the Air Force. But for women, that still wasn't really a possibility. Even though they were able to get their license and they were able to have a place in aviation, they still were not able to get paid for it. So this is, again, this money issue is also what's going to direct and put Amelia on the trajectory of becoming as famous as she became. This was on purpose. We're going to get to it. On May 16th of 1922, Amelia Earhart becomes the 16th woman to be granted her pilot's license in the United States. So she wasn't the first woman again. There are 15 other women before her that got her license. And again, we're going to get to why Amelia became so famous versus these other women. But then on October 22nd, a few months later, later down the line of 1922, Amelia ends up breaking a record because she's able to take her plane to 14,000 feet in altitude. And this is the highest any woman had ever taken an airplane. Now, in the 1920s, a man named Charles Lindbergh had become the first pilot to do a transatlantic flight. And then in 1928, Amelia got the opportunity to also participate in a transatlantic flight. However, with this transatlantic flight, she was not the pilot. She was a passenger. She was the only female passenger in this transatlantic flight that flew from the American continent over to Europe. Because she was a woman who sat in the airplane with the pilot, as she says, she did not think she was just dead weight, like a bag of potatoes, that's her quote, coming across the, the ocean. But because she was the first woman to do it, to get to be brave enough to get in this flying contraption and fly over the ocean, she gained a lot of publicity. People started calling her Lady Lindy because she apparently looked a lot like Charles Lindbergh. They also called her the Queen of the Air. And at this time, there was a man named George Putnam. George Putnam was on this flight as well, and he was kind of an explorer himself. He was an adventurous man himself. And so he was documenting his father owned like a publishing company. And so he was documenting this, this, this definitely this moment in history where human beings are now flying across the ocean. So he got to know Amelia at this time. Now, what cracks me up, here we go, guys, here we go into the money aspect because women could not make a living flying. Only men could, they could fly. They just couldn't get paid for it. George Putnam took Amelia Earhart and basically made her an influencer. I mean, I was reading all this and I was like, holy crap, Amelia Earhart was literally an influencer. This is what, this is how she made her money because Amelia Earhart wanted, at that point, she was hungry for it. She wanted to be the first female to eventually fly across the ocean by herself. She had already broken a record with getting a, a, her plane that high up in altitude, However, in order to do this, she needed money. She needed sponsorship. And there was no way that any company was going to pay a woman to do this like they had paid Charles Lindbergh. And so George Putnam took Amelia on as almost like a client, like he was like her agent. And so he started to tout her to all of these newspapers, all of these radio shows, and she got endorsement deals. I mean, I'm reading this and I'm like, how come nobody has actually realized that she was an influencer? Like, I, I feel like I'm the first person, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like I'm the first person talking about Amelia Earhart to be like, yo, bro, this is, this is what an influencer does. You know, for me, like, like example, my YouTube channel does not make that much money. How I make my money off of my videos, though, are my sponsorship deals right? Spooky too. Mermaid, all these different spot is Sia, these different sponsorship deals that I get. That's how I'm able to continue to take the time to do these deep dives and put this product out. Same thing for Amelia. Now, what's interesting, you guys, is one of the big products that Amelia was the influencer for that she endorsed was Lucky Stripe cigarettes. Now that's not strange because at that time, like everyone smoked. So whatever, not that big of a deal, but they had her as the face of Lucky Strike cigarettes. Now, whoa, this is another rabbit hole that I want to go deeper down into. And I would love to hear y'all's opinions down in the comment section below. Part of the money 
that she made as an influencer for Lucky Strike cigarettes went to fund, wait for it, drum roll, went to fund Admiral Byrd's expedition of the South Pole. What? What? We've covered a long time ago, we covered Admiral Byrd. I, I think the first year I opened this channel, I'll, if I can find those videos, I'll put them down in the description box below. He's the dude that was like, yo, there's a whole civilization in the earth, like Agartha. Like we got, we got a hollow earth and there are people living in our earth. That's, that's that dude. That's that dude, Admiral Byrd. So there's a connection between Amelia Earhart and Admiral Byrd. And I don't think that it was just that George Putnam was like helping. There's more to that story. There's more to that story. I don't know if I'm able to find that much information, but there's more to that story. Anyway, let's continue. Obviously, because of her being an influencer and because George Putnam really focused on the fact that she was a woman, I am woman, hear me roar, um, she became a celebrity. I'm laughing because the whole lesbian thing, you guys, I mean, she's obvious, she was a lesbian. Like, let, let's just be obvious about this. Like, she definitely was a lesbian. Um, there's no shame in that, but they, de I don't know why people didn't pick up on this before. Um, but he did tout her as kind of being there. Er, I am, I am woman, hear me roar to market to girls. And so she became this huge celebrity at the time of her life before her disappearance. She was one of the biggest celebrities in the world, not just the United States, which I didn't, I knew she was famous, but I didn't know she was that famous. She also became really good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was also allegedly a lesbian. So that's interesting, right? Now, George Putnam himself was married at the time. He ended up leaving his wife. And as he was managing Amelia, he wanted to marry her. Her. Now, again, I said, I think she's a lesbian. He asked her to marry him like six times and she said no, but she finally relented. And she wrote this very formal letter to George Putnam, like on the eve of their wedding. And this letter is very, very interesting. I'm going to put a bit of it up on this video. Basically, she was telling him like, I'm going to marry you, but this is more a business arrangement because we work really well together in a partnership for my brand, basically. I mean, I don't think they called it a brand back then. This is me adding, you know, modern words to what was happening. She was a brand. She was the Amelia Earhart brand, just like my brand is Esoteric Atlanta. That was her brand, and that's how she made money, and he's the one that made that happen for her. So he was basically allowing her to make the money through these sponsorship deals and influence deals and her brand in order to fund what she really wanted to do, which was to be adventurous and fly all over the world. So she finally relented and agreed to marry him, but she basically said, like, I'm not going to be faithful to you. I don't expect you to be faithful to me. I want to be alone. I don't want you being around me all the time. And um, I'm not going to change my name, which was wild back then. Like women, that didn't happen back then. Women, women always changed their name. So she was very much saying like, we're getting married because this is beneficial for the business. And I, I like you as a person. I like hanging out with you, but I'm not romantically in love with you is basically how I interpret it to be. So let's look at part of this letter. Part of this letter, in fact, says, I want you to understand I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. I may have to keep some place where I can go to be my myself now and then, for I cannot guarantee to endure at all times the confinement of even an attractive cage. I'm a pretty independent woman myself. Like I like having my own stuff and doing my own stuff, but I'm a heterosexual woman. I want to be with my boyfriend. Like, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's a little weird. That's just a little weird. Probably a very different story today if she were alive. If she were alive today, she wouldn't be probably as famous as she was. I mean, that's kind of the, the time period, as I was saying, the time period she lived in and the, the obstacles she was up against as a woman and the way that she was able to bring money in to, to do her expeditions was very new for that time. And for her, 
it, it was a necessity. Her being famous was a necessity for her. I don't think she wanted to be famous. I think she just wanted to freaking fly an airplane. But this was all a means to an end for her to be able to, to do that. And so if she had been born at any other time period, I don't think Miss Amelia Earhart would have been famous at all. Right? I think she just would have been a female pilot. But the fact that she was in this time period and there were already other female pilots who were also like married with children and weren't pursuing, they just wanted to fly. They weren't pursuing the goals that Amelia was pursuing. She was able to garnish the, the fame that she had. And of course that tied to Admiral Byrd is weird to me too, but that's a, it's definitely a story for a different day. So again, on February 7th, 1931, George Putnam and Amelia Earhart get married. They both wore suits to the wedding. Like, part of me just wants to buy a wedding dress just to have it because I'm a girl and I like that kind of stuff. But I, I asked my boyfriend, like, what he would do. Like, if we were to get married, if I were to show up on the wedding day in a suit, he'd be like, I probably would be like, who the hell am I marrying? You know, so there's that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, to each their own, February 7th, 1931, they get married. In the 30s, it's obviously we're, we're gearing up to her final disappearance, which would happen six years later in 1937. In 1934, Amelia Earhart decides this is it. This is it. She's going to fly from the, the American continent over to Paris. She's going to do the same thing Charles Lindbergh did many, many years before. Now, something happens, though. She flies 14 hours, 56 minutes, and she starts to have some mechanical problems. It's really bad weather. And so she has to land her plane. She ends up landing her plane in northern Ireland right outside of Derry and I thought this was hysterical because when she lands the plane she lands it in a pasture like obviously this is very different than how we fly today and this Irish farmer comes out and he's like did you fly far and she goes from America <laughs> so she does even though she doesn't make her mark of landing in Paris she does do something no other woman has ever done. She flew across the Atlantic Ocean by herself as the pilot. So that's cool. In 1934, her and her husband, George Putnam, also moved back to California. And on January 11th, 1935, she flies solo from Honolulu to Oakland, California. So we're ramping up. There's more flights she did I'm not going to get into, but we're ramping up. She, her, she's testing her limits. You know, she's doing all these major flights over water now, which obviously is way more dangerous than flying over land. And around this time, she's given a ton of honors. She is giving the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress. She is giving the Cross of Knights of the Legion of Honor from the French government. And she's given the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society from President Herbert Hoover at this time. Now, did she deserve these awards? Maybe. I don't know. There's some debate between that. Like, some people say she actually wasn't that great of a pilot. It was just kind of like a freak show because she was a female pilot. So I don't know if these awards were actually merited or if they were part of a publicity stunt set up by George Putnam to get her name out there and get her even more notoriety to get her more lucrative sponsorship deals. You know, we just had the Olympics. I know my friend Jamie Soleil, who was an Olympic gold medalist from Canada back in the early 2000s, she talked about that. I don't know if she talked about it on a show or off air to me that a lot of times when you are even an athlete, the money is not really coming from the sport. The money is coming from when you're really good at the sport, the endorsement deals you get afterwards. Same thing here. Same, 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 right? Even as a yoga teacher myself, my the main bulk of my money doesn't come from teaching but it might come from like a, a brand that i wear as a teacher right so these endorsement deals are a big deal that's what gets your names out there which puts, puts to get you notoriety so with these awards was, were they merited some people say no because she actually wasn't that great of a pilot she was good enough and some people say yes and some people say again just publicity stunt that's all this is is a big publicity stunt there might be a deeper reason too there might be some aluma shmati stuff going on i don't know though i don't want to judge somebody too quickly obviously they're red flags all over the story but um that would be definitely a question for someone like our whistleblower friends over on aquarius rising africa now in 1936 this is when amelia Earhart started to plan her big world tour the one where she disappeared she wants to fly all she wants to circle the world she wants to go all the way around the world 
So she starts planning it. She's got to find her coordinates, where she's going to land, how much gas or fuel it's going to take to get to from point A to point B. Some points are going to be further apart in stops. She's got to notify all the air, what, what was at that point, the air traffic controllers. They didn't call it that back then. She's got to get in touch with the Navy and the Coast Guard and the governments to make sure she's secure. And she gets this guy named Fred Noonan. Fred Noonan is a really great navigator, especially a celestial navigator. And so basically for most of the journey, it's just going to be Amelia and Fred. That's it. Which makes me think that George Putnam knew his wife was a lesbian because I don't know many men who would let their wives or be happy about their wives going around the world in a tiny airplane with another man which just the two of them so that's suspicious i don't think my boyfriend would like that at all that's suspicious to me too but nonetheless let's kind of get into what happened when she finally went about her her grand voyage where she disappeared amelia Earhart had decided that she was going to go west she was going to go from California to Hawaii, then across the Pacific Ocean. But there had been a problem with takeoff. Now, the problem that they had at takeoff delayed their trip by a couple of months. And some podcasters said that I listened to that if the trouble at takeoff had been greater than it was, it probably would have saved her life. But the trouble they had at takeoff was actually quite minor. And so they were just delayed by a couple of months. And because they were delayed, because of the wind change, Amelia Earhart had to renegotiate, renavigate her trip. So instead of going west, she's now going to go east. So on the 21st of May, 1937, Amelia Earhart took off going east across the United States. Over a month she continues to go east and her disappearance happened literally at the last leg of her journey back to california on june 29th of 1937 amelia Earhart and fred noonan left darwin australia for new guinea once they refueled in papua new guinea amelia and noonan only had seven thousand miles left to go before they got to the finish line. They were so close. On July 2nd of 1937, Earhart and Noonan took off from Ley in Papua New Guinea. They were headed to Howland Island. They would never arrive. Now Howland Island is a tiny island. It is only two and a half miles long. From Papua New Guinea to Howland Island would have been about a 20-hour flight. Howland Island itself is just north of the equator and it is still to this day a nature reserve. The Coast Guard was sitting outside of Howland Island waiting for Earhart and Noonan to land. They were waiting for the radio radios to motion them down to the island. Now, because this island is so tiny, you guys, two and a half miles. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in kilometers, but two and a half miles is tiny. Like, I probably walk two and a half miles just teaching a yoga class. The steps I take is probably the equivalent of two and a half miles. This is tiny. So if you are up in the sky, this is definitely an island that you could miss. You might not be able to see it. So this was definitely a very dangerous stopping point for Amelia. Again, it was 20 hours to get from Papua New Guinea to Howland Island. So even though this island is hard to miss, we also have this other uh, extra stress, fuel. We might run out of fuel. But the Coast Guard is there, nonetheless. They're radioing with Amelia Earhart. They're waiting to help her land at Howland Island. Once she lands in Howland Island, she only has two more stops. She's going to go to Hawaii and then, boom, back in Oakland, California. So this is like, hold your breath. Once we make this landing, we're golden. She's good. She's going to make it all the way home. Now, they start to hear radios coming in from Amelia. Amelia claims that she cannot see the island nor can she see the Coast Guard. She thinks in her panic transmission that the Coast Guard's not there, but they were there. Now, a problem ensued because they realized that they could hear Amelia, but she could not hear them. So they're getting her radios. They're trying to radio back to her, and it's obvious she's not hearing them. 
The Coast Guard themselves is panicking because they know that she's running out of fuel, that this is bad. She can't see them. They can't they can't see her, but they can rate it with her and she's going to run out of fuel. So everybody's panicking at this moment and 8.45 AM, they lose all radio transmission with her. Poof, she's gone. Or so they say, we'll get to that at the end. Immediately, there's a search for Amelia. Immediately, they know something is wrong. The Navy gets involved. The Coast Guard gets involved for two weeks straight. Everybody is searching for Amelia and Fred Noonan. On the 18th of July, 1937, they halted all search and basically proclaimed her and Noonan dead. To this day, or so they say, no bodies or plane wreckage have been found. Because the truth is not the official narrative. But before we get into all these scandalous conspiracy theories about Amelia Earhart's disappearance, I want to take a brief word from our sponsors. As I just said earlier in this episode, for people like me, independent content creators, or people like Amelia Earhart, we make our money off of these endorsement deals because the thing we love to do the most, which for me is these deep dives, don't necessarily pay the bills. And these deep dives do take a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of research. It's a full-time job. And so like Amelia Earhart, having a full-time job to be able to learn how to fly and break all these records for women everywhere to be respected in the field of aviation, I too have endorsements. Now, I do not, will not take endorsements from companies that I don't believe in. Don't worry, you guys. I will never be a spokesperson for Lucky Stripe cigarettes. But one of my favorite products that companies that endorses me is a company called Spooky2. And Spooky2 is a Rife machine. It's based off of Tesla technology. So if you're somebody who's into alternative health and wellness, this is definitely a company you might want to look into. I'm going to play a brief um, commercial from Spooky2 to kind of explain to you more about the recovery free features of this this instrument it's also it also works well on your animals now spooky Two sister company is a company called mirror mate who also endorse and sponsor me and so all the all this is going to be down in the description box below you guys but if you would like to purchase anything from spooky Two or mirror mate anything at all at any time at checkout you just enter my name bryce watson b-r-i-c-e-w-a-t-s-o-n and you will get 5% off any and all of your purchases. Welcome to the Ricky's Undead. I'm here with my dog, Bourbon, and he wanted to share a little bit about his story so that we can help other pet parents know that there are other holistic and alternative methods out there to helping your dog on their road to recovery and healing. So a little bit about Bourbon's story. We had him... Um, he was running, let's say, and it was a, a rainy day and he went to run up the steps and he skipped a step and landed spread eagle and left out a huge yelp. Um, so thankfully, my son carried him down the steps for me, got him in the car and we took him right to the vet. So they confirmed that he did in fact severely tear um, basically completely both of his ACLs or what's called a CCL in dog lingo and they said that he needed surgery to heal and recover however he was only eight months old at the time and they would not do surgery on him because his growth platelets were still open in his legs so they sent me home with an injured dog and said bring him back when he's a year old and they would do the surgery now the surgery, mind you, was going to cost $5,000 per leg and two months recovery in a crate while he was recovering and the surgery had to be done one leg at a time. So that would be $10,000 and four months of him being in a crate. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me. So I encourage you to go to Spooky2 and download their software just to kind of look around and see if maybe your ailments are in the database, because I bet you they are. So now let's get into it. So the first thing I did with Bourbon is I took the connectors 
and I hooked him up to the tens pads. So what I did is I took the tens pads and I placed them on the inside of his thigh by where his knee is. So right around where the actual ACL or CCL would be located. And then I ran what we call a biofeedback scan. The biofeedback scan in the database, what it does is it sends electromagnetic frequencies into your electromagnetic field within your body. Anything that is not supposed to be there, it calls a hit. So it records up to 10 hits per biofeedback scan. It takes about five or six minutes and boom, you have your, your results. So then, once I record and save those hits, I turn around and I switch it to contact mode, keeping the TENS pads in the exact same spot that I just ran the biofeedback scan, and then I run a 30-minute contact session for him. Now, he feels so amazing when he's getting these frequencies that if I'm in messing with the Rife Therapy machine and getting something ready maybe for myself or a client, he will actually come over and be like, hey, thinking he's going to get a session. That's how much he loves it because he knows it's making him feel better. All right, you guys, let's get into these theories because boy, oh boy, do they lied to us, you guys. They effing lied to us. The whole idea that they lost transmission from Amelia Earhart at 8.45 a.m. that morning of July 3rd is complete BS. They lied. And it's not just a hearsay. There were so many witnesses that heard more transmissions we're going to get into it because one of the biggest theories regarding amelia Earhart, bigger than i always thought the crashing into the ocean was the biggest theory that's just kind of why i assumed it happened but apparently even scientists who are not like woo woo conspiracy theorists like we are actually believe this one theory because we have evidence we have actual evidence to back that this is what happened so there's another island called gardner island that's not the name of the island now the name of the island is like Nikaruru or something it's it's anyway Gardner Island was the name of the island at this time at this time so let's talk a little bit about Gardner Island so this is an island in the Phoenix Island region now Gardner Island is about 400 miles southeast of Howland Island obviously 400 miles that's a long distance but when you're an airplane it's not that long of a distance yeah now Gardner Island is at this time, and I think even still today, is not inhabited by anybody. The last people who left Gardner Island were in the late 1800s. In fact, 1892, people left the island. They had tried to set up um, a, like a coconut colony, and 29 people moved there in the late 1800s to try to pr create produce, but it, the conditions were not that great, and so in 1892, they, they left the island, so it was not being inhabited. Now, something to remember is that the, the people who originally inhabited this island in the late 1800s were Polynesian. They were not white, and this is important when we look at some of the remains that were found on this island, because Amelia Earhart was white. Fred Noonan was white. They were white people, right? The, the original inhabitants that tried to create a business there weren't, all right? We know the sun reacts differently to different skin colors, so keep this in mind. All right, so Gardner Island is interesting. The island itself has like a perimeter of coast and reef, and in the middle, there's a lagoon. So the fact that she was even able to kind of land on this island, according to this theory, is phenomenal in itself because it's like it's like a rubber band. I was seeing if I have a rubber band around where it's like this this island and then water, right? Okay, so why do we think that she might have actually landed at Gardner Island in distress instead of Howland Island? There are there is evidence on the island that some white people were there, but nonetheless, let's go back to these transmissions that were going through. Again, the fake news, the propaganda, they tell us the last transmission they heard from Amelia Earhart was 8.45 in the morning. But then a bunch of other people said, uh-uh, we heard her at 6 p.m. that night. Because you see, my friends, at this time in history, there was no TV. 
everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of people, the upper middle class people of the world had radios. They had radios. I used to ask my grandparents all the time what it was like to sit around the radio and listen to like stories on the radio, like where people would like, basically like a podcast like we do today. You might just be listening to this show like that today. And so what people would do during this time is they would sit around their radio and tune their radios in to try to find music or whatever type of entertainment they're looking for, and they would actually have to tune it. You know, for, for kids today, they might not understand this. I'm Growing up in the 80s and the late 1900s, you know, before TV got as fancy as it is now, we would have those bunny ears, you know, and sometimes you would have to, like, tune the bunny ears to pick up so it wasn't... Like, it wasn't like snowy on the, on the screen. Same thing with the radio. And so, wildly enough, at 6 p.m. that night, people all over North America... So North America, United States, and Canada, as, as, as far as Florida, there's a really famous case, like a little girl named Betty, a, a teenager in Betty in Florida, that literally picked up Amelia's transmissions. They picked her up. They knew who she was. Like, I'm like, this is not some random, like, they think they hear, it's not like a spirit box. And I, I work with spirit box sometimes, I'm not saying, but it's not, it's clear. And they know who Amelia Earhart is. She's freaking famous. She's as famous then as the Kardashians are now. They know who this woman is. And so imagine all these people are sitting in their house looking for a news report, looking for a soap opera, looking for music. And they all of a sudden start to hear distressed Mayday signals from Amelia Earhart, America's sweetheart, who is literally supposed to be finishing up her world-breaking world tour on her airplane. So people started writing down what they were hearing. Now, the time periods that she would do her transmission was the same every single day. And for Amelia, at the time, in the time zone she was in, it was always night for her. And they believed this was the, this was the case because it was low tide at night. And in order for her to do the transmission, she would have to crank the plane, right? And so she would keep the plane off during the day when that tide was high and she couldn't crank it anyway. And at low tide, she would crank the plane to try to radio in for help. Okay, and so it came at the same times. And so people started realizing that's what's going on. She's landed somewhere, it's low tide, and she's using the rest of her fuel to try to to try to ask for help. Now they could definitely hear a lot of people said they heard a male's voice as well, which was Fred Noonan. And this is what's so freaking sad. So many people said that they could tell that Fred was delirious. Now in one of the transmissions, Amelia had stated that Fred had injured his head pretty badly. And he was definitely losing consciousness. And they could hear her on the inner card trying to get Fred to come back to the plane. Like she was really, really worried about, I guess when they landed an impact, he hit his head really hard. And he was definitely losing his grip on reality. Um, obviously, this is a very hot island. They're probably, that didn't help the situation. Um, they also heard Amelia crying in the transmission a lot, like begging for help. And a lot of people wrote down what they thought was her saying New York City. And they couldn't figure out why she was saying New York City. Well, now, all these years later, people who are investigating scientists, not just conspiracy theorists like us, but scientists who are investigating this claim believe she wasn't saying New York City, that they got that wrong. What she was actually saying was SS Norwick city ss norwick city was a cargo ship who had basically shipwrecked on gardner island from the united kingdom and so the coast guard the navy all these different governments knew that ship was there like this wasn't some big secret it wasn't one of these missing ships that we have floating around in like the mary celeste like floating around this they, they knew that ship was there it had been shipwrecked they left it it was the SS Norwick City. And so what a lot of people speculate is what Amelia Earhart was saying was SS Norwick City. There are two reasons she was saying this. One, it identified Gardner Island because all of the governments around the world knew that that ship was had run, a, run amok on this island. So this was a big, basically, marker. This is the island where they are. They also think that Amelia actually landed by the ship. So not only was the ship giving people a pinpointed location of where she was, 
but she was literally by the remains of, of the Norwich City ship. Now, even though all these private citizens, as well as the Coast Guard, innocent people in the Coast Guard were hearing these transmissions, nobody bothered to go and check Gardner Island. No one. What? Are you kidding me? If I were Amelia Earhart's family, you best believe I would be like on the news, on the radio news every day, kicking up shit. She's telling you where she is. We, this isn't just one or two people who are going, I think we're getting transmission from this island down 400 miles south. There are people all over the world, all over the United States, anywhere near where that they can pick up that transmission being like, yo, she's on Gardner Island. She landed on Gardner Island. And other people are like, well, that's not possible because of the fuel and how far it was. Yes, it is possible. They're, they're speculating that she got caught in wind and this wind moved her. So it doesn't take a lot of fuel if the wind is moving you itself. I'm not a pilot and I know that. So all in the late 1900s, there was this group called the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, or TIGER for short. And so they started to, again, late, late 1900s, she's long gone. They start to investigate the this obvious evidence that she had landed at Gardner Island. And what they found was pretty remarkable. There was not a lot of remains of a plane. There was some plane wreckage, but not enough to really solidly say this was Amelia Earhart's plane. Makes sense, right? It would have eventually floated into the ocean, right? Part to the plane, part of the, the Norwich City boat that had also shipwrecked there was kind of, uh, not much was left of that either. But they found, they found campsites where people had been trying to cook food. They found turtle shells. They found fish heads with skeletal bodies, which definitely shows that a white person, because we don't eat fish heads, were trying to eat the fish. Um, Y'all, they found makeup from the 1930s that was American. They found a compact mirror from makeup that looked like she had broken it to use to try to signal for help. They found some clothes from the 1930s, and including a woman's shoe. They even found an instrument that navigators used, especially Fred Noonan, who were celestial navigators, a particular instrument, equipment that only select navigators had, like Fred Noonan. They found that on the island. And they found some skeletal remains. Now, there's not enough with the skeletal remains for them to get conclusive DNA matching. But what they do know, they can tell from the bones, is that these people were white. Now, typically, you're probably thinking, like, how is that possible? Because typically with skeletal bones, we really can't tell race. Something had, like, gotten on the bones. As they were getting skinnier and as they were basically dying, Amelia Earhart was a very freckle-faced white woman, as was Fred Noonan. So they found this, like, homemade ointment, elixir, that basically she was trying to use a sunscreen and it had stained the bones. Now I'm not a chemist, so I can't really talk about how that actually happened, but the researchers, the scientists looking at these bones were like, these are not Polynesian bones. A Polynesian person would not do this. We're looking at, with the evidence of this, the stains of this elixir on the bones, we're looking at somebody who was trying to protect their skin from the intense heat. This is a white person. These are two white people. Now we don't have full skeletal remains. I, I'm assuming a lot of the skeletal remains probably got washed away with the tide. So what's left though, we do see this. And this to me is enough for me to personally believe this is what happened. We're, we're gonna go through the other theor th uh, theories, especially the North Carolina theory as well, but there's enough evidence for me that I think this is actually what happened. And there's enough eyewitness accounts on the radios that it, this, is, this is a realistic, realistically this is what happened to them. Why this was allowed to happen to them, I don't know. That's, that's 
the unsolved part of this. Why they didn't go and check out Gardner Island when, when they could obviously hear transmission coming from the island. I don't know. I, I, I don't know why they didn't do that. But let's go through the other conspiracies. Another big conspiracy, people feel like this was right on the heels of World War II. And so people feel like she obviously was like taken down by the Japanese. And by being taken down by the Jap Japanese, she was either unalived as a prisoner of war, her and Fred Nuna were, or she specifically was forced to be what they called a Tokyo Rose. Now, a Tokyo Rose was an English-speaking woman who would go on the radio and basically spout out uh, Japanese propaganda. And so if you are, if you're a POW, um, you might not be unalived. They might take you and force you to do their work and be on these radio programs in an English speaking, giving Japanese propaganda. Now this Tokyo Rose conspiracy was so big at the time of her disappearance that George Putnam, her husband actually uh, listened to a ton of these broadcasts, trying to see if he recognized any of the voices, which makes sense. I would recognize my boyfriend's voice if, if that were the case, you know, and, and none of the voices met matched what what was Amelia's now there's another there's two obviously two conspiracies of her faking this and going off and living another life the first case we have is a woman named Irene Bowman and she was allegedly born on October 1 1904 and died on July 7th 1982 Irene was a banker from New Jersey. Now in 1970, a book called Amelia Earhart Lives by Joe Kloss was released. This book was based on the speculations of a retired pilot named Joseph Gervais. Joseph Gervais had met with one of Amelia's friends, like Amelia Earhart's real life friends, a woman named Violet Gentry. Like, in like the 50s and 60s. And Violet introduced Joseph to a friend, a friend of hers named Irene Bowman. And Joseph was so taken aback by this woman because she looked identical to Amelia Earhart. And the fact that Violet was friends with Amelia when Amelia was alive made him start to speculate that this woman was actually Amelia Earhart. And she, for some reason, faked her unaliving and moved to New Jersey and assumed a new identity. He did tons of research into this woman's background and tried to figure out why she would do this. Obviously, if she's coming to an aviation conference, she's still very much interested in aviation. But for some reason, this Amelia Earhart had decided to, to leave her life behind and become this Irene Bowman. Well, 1970, again, when the book was released, based off of this guy's research, there was a lawsuit filed um, and they had to retract the book because Irene Bowman was very defiant that she was not Amelia Earhart. Now, looking into this myself, I don't actually think she was Amelia Earhart. They ended up doing, after she passed away, they ended up doing um, some analysis. She refused to give her fingerprints. She would never give her fingerprints. That's suspicious. However, I can see like how you would be defiant and be like, dude, I'm not her. Like, stop it. Leave me alone. But some people did do an analysis with like Amelia's skull and her skull and photographs and they didn't match. They looked alike, but they, they didn't match. But nonetheless, after she passed away, three more books were written speculating that this woman was M Amelia Earhart. These books were Stand By to Die in 1985, Amelia Earhart Survived 2003, and Amelia Earhart Beyond the Grave written in 2016. Now, a lot of people do speculate that Amelia Earhart was actually a spy for the United States government hired by the Roosevelts, and that might be why she was given a new identity, because she needed to be removed as a spy because something was going amok. So maybe the whole transmissions of her going down were faked for us to think that she disappeared when in reality the government was just putting her like in a witness protection program or something. I don't know. And maybe that's why they, they kind of let these transmissions go but not actually go and find her because she was being relocated that's kind of another conspiracy but the North Carolina conspiracy is what's super interesting to me because apparently there in Southern Pines North Carolina according to this TikTok that I can't find now it's disappeared apparently people in the Southern Pines North Carolina have always known that Amelia Earhart took on a new identity and moved to Southern Pines, North Carolina, 
with her lesbian lover. And apparently, according to this TikToker, she is very happily buried there to this day with her lesbian lover. Now, again, Southern Pines is in North Carolina, which is where the Wrights brother, it's it's not near where the Wrights brothers uh created their airplane, the first in flight, but it's the same state. This is also the state where the lovely Paysors that we've been digging into have all their their um debauchery and you know hiding and espionage so north carolina is kind of a hot hot spot for these conspiracies now i did however find a website i'm going to try to pull it up here when i was trying to look more into this situation with amelia Earhart with southern pines north carolina so let's look at this website together because this is the only only reference i could find like why would amelia Earhart um go to southern pines Hold on, you guys. Let me see here. All right, here we go. And this is all I could find. Amelia Earhart and Southern Pines. Tomorrow night, November 17th, so this was written on November 16th, 2011, at the Southern Pines Public Library, the Family Fun Night program will feature a talk on Amelia Earhart. All right, so Southern, okay, Pinehurst, North Carolina. So she's obviously been here before we don't see a lot of in the research that i did on amelia Earhart's documented life she really didn't go to the southeast that much she was back and forth between the midwest california new york and canada so this is interesting the pioneering pilot was one of the many prominent visitors to southern pines and pinehurst in the early 20th century there's a nice photo of digitalnorthcarolina.org of Amelia Earhart in 1931 for the collection of the Tufts Archives, Pinehurst, North Carolina. The photo was probably taken when Earhart flew into Southern Pines for a brief stop. Her visit was featured on the front page of the pilot, November 13, 1931. Amelia Earhart, Mrs. George Palmer Putnam, who flew across the Atlantic in June 1928 and who since then has continued to be prominently identified with aviation, was greeted by a crowd which numbered well over to a thousand persons on her first visit to Sand Hills Wednesday afternoon. Miss Earhart brought her plane gracefully down on the Knollwood flying field, rose up in the cockpit and apologized for being late. She was greeted by the officials of the field the mayor and the commissioner of Southern Pines, representatives of Pinehurst, and by Mrs. W.C. Arco, wife of the vice president of the Beechnut Packing Company, sponsors of her acquaintance trip around the country. The transatlantic flyer flew here from Fayetteville, spent about 25 minutes at the field, shook hands with scores of people, gave her autograph to numerous small boys and girls, supervised the refueling of her weird-looking Auto Auto Giro took the ship almost evidently into the air and departed. Okay, so remember how I said that Lucky Stripe was one of her sponsorships? That's cigarettes. North Carolina is one of the biggest states for tobacco. And it's saying here that she has a sponsorship in, in Southern Pines. So is it is is there a possibility that this conspiracy theory that Amelia Earhart changed her identity, left the old Amelia behind, took on a new identity with her lesbian lover, and just settled in Southern Pines because she already had connections there and kept the town just kept it a secret for her? Because this TikTok, to me, it was like this guy was like, duh, everybody knows she, I mean, everybody knows she ended up in Southern Pines. We all knew that was Amelia Earhart. We just kept our mouth shut, let her live her life. Like I said, my biggest belief is probably the Gardner Island situation. But this is also very compelling to me too. And it's compelling to me also because I can't find a lot of information. If this was a well-known conspiracy, then how come I can't find anything on it now? How come I cannot? I even went back in my search history to find that TikTok and I cannot find it. I have scoured TikTok, Instagram, everywhere, trying to find this clip of this guy saying this, and it is gone. I cannot find it. So are, is this a possibility too? Seems like they're trying to hide something if it is. And maybe the Gardner Island theory and the Southern Pines theory are one and the same. 
maybe she did land in Gardner Island, put out those transmissions to give people the wrong idea of what happened when she was literally picked up and taken to start a new life in Southern Pines. What do y'all think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below.